Hey everyone and welcome back to this class, Artificial Intelligence Reinforcement Learning in Python. In this lecture we are going to answer the question, what is reinforcement learning? How is it different from supervised and unsupervised learning, and what are its applications? We talked a little bit about these things in the introduction, and in this lecture we are going to expand on those things. The first thing you'll notice is how different reinforcement learning is from supervised and unsupervised learning. If you were to pictorially show how close each of these are, you can see here that supervised and unsupervised learning aren't that different. You saw in my earlier course on unsupervised deep learning and deep NLP that we can actually use unsupervised learning to pre-train a neural network before doing supervised learning. In contrast, reinforcement learning is way out there. With supervised and unsupervised learning, we always imagine the same interface, which we've modeled around scikit-learn. For a supervised machine learning interface, we usually have the functions fit, which takes in the input samples x and the targets y, and predict, which takes in the input samples x and tries to accurately predict y. For an unsupervised learning interface, we usually have just a fit function, which only takes in some input samples x. Remember that there are no targets in unsupervised machine learning. Sometimes we have a transform function which takes in some input samples x and turns it into a different representation that we call z. PCA autoencoders and restricted Boltzmann machines are examples of algorithms we've seen that can do that. In contrast, methods like k-means clustering and Gaussian mixture models have a fit function but they don't transform data. Instead, the parameters of the fitted model tell us something about the data, like which cluster does the data point belong to, and what is the variance of that cluster. The common theme with both of these is that the interface to these is just training data. You take in some random training data, either x and y or just x, and you call the fit function. In the case of supervised learning, you can then make predictions on future data. This by itself can be useful. Imagine you've written an app where you can scan a photo you take at the supermarket classify what you took a photo of, and then return nutritional information about it. But reinforcement learning is different. Reinforcement learning can guide an agent for how to act in the real world. So the interface to a reinforcement learning agent is much more broad than just data. It's the entire environment. That environment can be the real world, or it can be a simulated world like a video game. As an example, you could create a reinforcement learning agent to vacuum your house. Then it would be interfacing with the real world. You could create a reinforcement learning agent to learn how to walk. That would also be interacting with the real world. You can be sure that the military is interested in such technologies. They want reinforcement learning agents that can replace soldiers. Not only to walk, but fight, defuse bombs, and make important decisions while they are out on a mission. So you see now why reinforcement learning is such a big leap from basic supervised and unsupervised learning. The interface isn't just data, but it could potentially be the entire world. The big leap isn't just that the interface with the AI is way more broad, but that reinforcement learning algorithms train in a completely different way as well. You'll see quite a lot of references to psychology, and indeed reinforcement learning can be used to model behavior. Reinforcement learning algorithms have objectives in terms of a goal. This is different from supervised learning where the objective is to get good accuracy or to minimize a cost function. Reinforcement learning algorithms get feedback as the agent interacts with its environment. So feedback signals, or as we like to call them rewards, are given automatically to the agent by the environment. This is much different from supervised learning where it can be extremely costly and time consuming to obtain hand-labeled data. So in this way, reinforcement learning is very different from supervised learning. Supervised learning requires a hand-labeled data set. Reinforcement learning learns automatically from signals in the environment, so there is no need for hand-labeled data. Let's expand on this idea of a goal. Phrasing our objective in terms of goals allows us to solve a much wider variety of problems. The goal of AlphaGo is to win Go. The goal of a video game AI is either to get as far as possible in the game or achieve a high score. What's interesting is when you consider animals and specifically humans. 
Evolutionary psychologists have said that our genes are selfish, and all they want to do is make more of themselves. This is really interesting because just like AlphaGo, we found many roundabout and unlikely ways to achieve this. Experts commented that AlphaGo used some surprising and unusual techniques. For example, you might have a desire to be rich and make lots of money. But have you ever wondered why you feel that way? Perhaps those with the specific set of genes that are related to the desire to be rich ended up being more prominent in our gene pool due to natural selection. Perhaps having lots of money led to better health care and social status, which then helped the genes to maximize their central goal, which was to make more of themselves. Although a number in your bank account has no direct relationship in terms of physical laws to how long you are going to live or to how much your genes are going to multiply, it's a novel solution to the problem. Now, desiring and successfully earning money is just a random example off the top of my head. You can replace that with any trait you want, like being healthy and strong or having strong analytical skills. Knowing the exact factors is a social scientist job. We are just interested in the fact that there is only one main goal that we want to maximize and various novel ways of achieving it. And these things are always fluctuating in time. At one point in history, seeking as much sugar as possible would give you energy and help you survive. Today we keep that trait, since evolution is slow, but in today's world that trait would actually kill us. Our genes' method of maximizing their reward is through mutation and natural selection, which is slow, but an AI's method of maximizing its reward is reinforcement learning, which is fast. Now let's get into some technical detail. Of course you can never sense the entire world at once. Even humans don't do this. We have sensors which feed signals to our brain from the environment. These signals don't tell us everything about the room we're in, much less the world. So we necessarily have limited information about our environment, as do robots with limited numbers and types of sensors. The measurements we get from these sensors, sight, sound, and touch, make up a state. In this course, we'll only look at environments where there are a small, finite number of states. But of course, it's possible to consider environments with an infinite number of states, too. Let's consider a simple example. Consider a tic-tac-toe board where we don't care about who wins. We just want to put X's and O's on the board. The board starts out as empty, and we continue to add X's or O's until the board is full. If you don't know how tic-tac-toe works, you can do a Google search and play the game yourself in the browser, directly in the search results. Remember that tic-tac-toe boards are 3x3 three three boards. What is the total number of states in this environment? I'll give you a minute to think about that, and then you can come back to the lecture. Since we're not considering a tic-tac-toe game where there is a winner after you get three X's or three O's in a row, this problem is very simple. Each location on the board has three possible states, empty, X, or O. There are nine locations on the board, so the total number of states is 3 to the power 9. Let's recap the terms we've talked about so far. There are three of them, and possibly more that I snuck in. The three important ones are agent, which is the thing that senses the environment and the thing we're trying to code intelligence and learning into. There's the environment. This is the real world or simulated world that your agent lives in. Then there's the concept of state. These are different configurations of the environment that the agent can sense. There are a couple more things to define in reinforcement learning that are central to the subject. First, there is the concept of reward. This is what differentiates reinforcement learning algorithms from other kinds of machine learning algorithms. An agent will try to maximize not only its immediate reward, but future rewards as well. Often, reinforcement learning algorithms will find novel ways of accomplishing this. I'm not a Go player myself, but we've heard that the AlphaGo program learned unique and unpredictable strategies that led to its beating a world champion at Go. These are things that aren't intuitive to humans, but reinforcement learning algorithms can automatically figure them out. 
One potentially dangerous aspect of this is the idea of unintended consequences. We've all heard about the idea that an AI could potentially wipe out humanity if it decides that is the best thing for us. Imagine you program your AI to minimize the number of human deaths, and then it decides that since humanity is going to grow exponentially, and hence more people are going to die as well, then it would be better to destroy everyone now in order to minimize more dying in the future. So there is some danger of unintended and dangerous side effects for AIs that are interacting with the real world. To give you a more low-level example of how and why rewards should be programmed intelligently, think of a robot trying to solve a maze. A reasonable goal might be to simply solve a maze. If you solve the maze, you get a reward of 1, otherwise you get a reward of 0. With this reward structure, it's possible for a robot to just implement a random strategy and eventually solve the maze. Because we never told the robot that it should try to solve the maze efficiently, then making random movements until the maze is solved still gets you the reward. Now imagine that we give a reward of minus one for every step the AI takes in the maze. Now the AI has incentive to solve the maze using the least number of steps, and so it will tend to find a more efficient solution this way. We'll demonstrate this in code later in the course. Notice how a negative reward is like a penalty, which it is. Reward is just the term we always use. It tells you how good or bad you're doing. Note that the reward is always a real number. So now we've defined these terms. Agent, environment, state, and reward, which is the thing we just talked about. The last important concept we need to talk about is actions. Actions are what the agent does in its environment. For example, if you're a 2D video game character, your actions might be up, down, left, right, and jump. This is an example of a finite set of actions. There are also examples of an infinite set of actions, but we won't discuss that in this course, unless the course is updated in the future to include them. The last three things we talked about are often thought about as a triple. You're in a state, you take an action, and you get a reward. We call these SAR, or State Action Reward Triples. In reinforcement learning, timing is an important concept as well, since every time you play a game, you get a sequence of states, actions, and rewards. Within this framework, you start in a state, S of t, you take an action, A of t, but you receive a reward of R of t plus 1. So the reward you get always results from the state and action you took in the previous step. This action also results in you being in a new state, S of t plus 1. So another important triple is S of t, A of t, and S of t plus 1. Usually we just denote this as S A S prime. So that's reinforcement learning in a nutshell. You program the agent to try to be intelligent. The agent interacts with its environment by being in a state, taking an action based on that state, which then brings it to another state. The environment gives the agent a reward, either positive or negative, when it arrives in the next state, and the goal of the agent is to maximize its total rewards.